The war in Ishbal is a major event in the world of Full Metal Alchemist. And really, it's the place where the story truly begins. Starting with an Amestrian soldier accidentally killing an Ishbalan child, the conflict eventually led to an all-out civil war spanning the next seven years. It was at this point that King Bradley launched Order 3066, sending state alchemists to the front lines to act as human weapons, and successfully annihilated their enemies. Now that we've got that exposition out of the way, I wanted to spend this video dissecting the series' approach to war, what it has to say about it, and what we can learn from its philosophy. The first question we have to ask is whether the Ishvalan War is just. Now, what exactly does that mean? There are actually five main conditions that must be met for a war to be considered just. Number one, the war being fought must be led by a legally recognized authority. If we look at FMA, we see that this is indeed the case. The war is being led by King Bradley, the Fuhrer of Amestrius. Condition number two, the cause of the war must be just, meaning there must be a good reason to go to war, like to put right or wrong or defend from an invasion. This condition is not met by the Ishvalan Civil War. The fight began with an accident blown out of proportion, and the only goal of the war was to procure human test subjects for the Philosopher's Stone. Number three is that the war must be a last resort. All other diplomatic options must have been exhausted. We actually have proof in the show that this is not the case. When the leader of the Ishvalans comes to talk with Bradley to reach a deal to end the bloodshed, he is rejected callously and forced to watch his people die. Number four is that there must be a reasonable chance of success. I actually have to give Amestrius credit for this one. The Amestrian government easily outnumbers the Ishvalans, and they've got their godlike state alchemists to boot, so they've got pretty good odds. The last condition for a war to be considered just is that only sufficient force must be used. <laughs> no. So clearly this war does not meet the necessary conditions to make it just, and that will be an important piece of information moving forward. The next question is slightly more difficult to answer. Should soldiers be held responsible for the actions they are ordered to perform? This is a contentious topic in the field of just war theory, the study of determining how and why war should be fought, especially since most countries are switching to a military of volunteers rather than drafting. The view of more traditional theorists like Francisco de Victoria is that no, they should not be held responsible. It is the duty of a soldier to do what they are ordered to do without question. In normal day-to-day -day life, killing others is wrong, they thought. But moral laws change in the times of war. When a soldier is pointing a gun at you, it becomes acceptable for you to defend yourself by any means necessary. Only the government or the military leaders giving the orders should be held morally responsible. On the other side, Jeff McMahon, a contemporary philosopher, is one of the revisionist just war theorists. They disagree with the idea that morality changes during battle and believe it's impermissible to fight in an unjust war. Say, for example, you get in a car accident because you were drunk. You can say the act of hitting another vehicle wasn't your fault since you were intoxicated, but it was your fault that you were both drunk and driving to begin with. That's exactly McMahon's point. Though you aren't deciding to kill someone of your own free will, you are still to blame since you decided to enlist. This philosophy is directly endorsed by the character of Zolf J. Kimbley. When asked by Hawkeye why the military had fallen so low and why they had to kill people, he said, Why? Because that's the duty of a state alchemist. Because those were the orders we were given. The moment you put on this uniform out of your own free will, you knew something like this could be expected of you. If you don't like it, you shouldn't have put it on in the first place. Why do you act as though you're the victim when this was the path you chose free of coercion? Even though he's largely an antagonist, he raises a strong point that sticks with our characters. They carry the weight of their sins for the rest of the series and stop trying to rationalize away their actions. But did Roy, Hawkeye, and the other soldiers even do anything wrong? The next question I hope to answer is, is it permissible to kill civilians during war? Now I know what you're thinking, of course not, Cat. that's terrible! Why would you even say such a thing? And I agree with you. Killing civilians is terrible, but as much as we'd like to believe otherwise, killing civilians has proven to be a very effective strategy in battle. It's an easy way to get attention, and it's often utilized by powerful governments in our own world. But does that make this action morally right? First, let's look at what political theorist Michael Walzer has to say about it. Walzer believed that there were two situations in which it was permissible to kill someone in war. Number one is if killing that person would save countless lives or stop a terrible thing. For example, if killing someone would stop the Nazis from invading Europe, you would be morally justified in killing them. Number two would be if that person had forfeited their right to life. Walzer believed that you forfeit your right to live when you pose a threat to other people. Even if a soldier is fighting for a just cause, they've still forfeited this right since they're armed and dangerous. They've alienated themselves from their humanity. This is particularly aimed at soldiers who, of course, pose a threat since they're fighting on a battlefield. 
So by Walzer's theory, it's all right to kill soldiers during war, but not civilians, since they've never forfeited their right to live. However, there are several problems with this rationale that contemporary philosopher Seth Lazar points out. First of all, if a soldier has been drafted against their will, or is just fighting to defend their homeland, how would it be fair to say they've forfeited their right to live? Secondly, what about soldiers who never fire their weapons? Surprisingly, only 15 to 25% of American soldiers in World War II who were in a position to fire their weapons actually did so, based on research by SIA Marshall. Thirdly, if you were put in a cannon and launched at your enemies, then you would be posing a threat, since your body could do harm to other people. This cannon example actually led many to rethink Walzer's ideas. Maybe it's not whether or not someone poses a threat, but who's responsible for that threat, i.e. the man that put the person in the cannon. So let's look at it from the form of responsibility. If we're only focused on those that can be considered responsible for a threat, then couldn't that group encompass civilians too? If you live in a democratic system, then wouldn't you be partially responsible for the actions of your state? Would that mean you forfeited your right to life? As you can see, this issue is a lot more complicated than it may initially seem, but the show takes a hard stance on the matter. From the regret of our characters and the dialogue they share, we know they feel they're doing wrong. The author portrays the Amestrians' actions as incorrect by having them led by a wrathful leader and endorsed by the story's villain. Regardless of whether the soldiers or the government are at fault, an atrocity was still committed against the people of Ishval. But why did this happen? It was a plan set in place by the homunculi, surely, but they only started the action. The people finished it. What is the author trying to say about the nature of war? My initial reaction would be to say the show presents a similar philosophy to Thomas Hobbes. Hobbes argued that humans, by their nature, are violent creatures. As he famously said, the condition of man is a condition of war, of everyone against everyone. So because of that, war is unavoidable. More recently, scholars like Raymond Dart and Robert Ardry discovered a scientific basis for this idea by claiming that modern day humans became the dominant humanoid through their martial prowess, and they retain this prowess through history. This is a good way to rationalize the behavior of the soldiers. It would make sense for their actions to be motivated by their cruel nature. After all, all the humans in the series possess the same sins of envy, greed, pride, sloth, lust, wrath, and gluttony inside of them. The same sins that Father tried to purge himself of. It wouldn't be a big step to assume that these traits led them to commit these acts of barbarity. The character we referenced earlier even endorsed this idea. Kimberly, the Red Lotus alchemist himself. After Hawkeye told him she didn't enjoy killing, he stated, Really? When you drop an enemy, can you tell me in all honesty that you don't, for a moment, indulge in the satisfaction and pride of a job well done, Miss Sharpshooter? And more importantly, Hawkeye doesn't say no. She indeed has this violent nature inside of her. But that solution just doesn't sit well with me. Sure, Kimberly endorses it, but many of his perspectives on the world differ from the resolutions the show comes to. And is the conclusion that humans are inhumane to one another, it is what it is, really what the author wanted us to take away from the series? The character of Father is the literal manifestation of this concept. He's the main antagonist of the series, and like I said earlier, tried to purge himself of his nasty and brutish nature. But he gets his comeuppance in the end. He's defeated by the brothers and scolded by Truth for attempting to fly too close to the sun. Perhaps his defeat is the author trying to say that this idea is flawed. Though human nature may be violent and cruel, Perhaps it's something else as well. But what do I know? I'm just some idiot on YouTube. So, what do you think? Should soldiers be held morally responsible for their actions? Is human nature good or bad? What makes a war just? Feel free to leave your answers in the comments below, and thank you guys so much for watching. As always, if you want to know more about the topics discussed in this video, I've left some links and reading recommendations in the doobly-doo. If you want to know more about the topic of human nature and whether we're shaped by nature or nurture, check out my first video on the philosophy of monster. Be warned though, the audio is quite awful. Uh, I, I have a Twitter now, so follow me there, link down below. Subscribe, like, share, and all that jazz, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Goodbye!